Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all this morning. I hope the holidays are going well. I do have a few announcements that we, um, and I've just got them written down in addition to what we've already got on the uh, back of our bulletin here. So we do have a lot of travelers um, today and, and over th- throughout this week. So let's continue to remember the Cobbs and Yanceys as well as Celeste. And uh, we did give away hams on Wednesday evening, about 50 of them, I believe. And it sounds like people were lined up probably a half hour early at least, uh, ready for those hams. And uh, I understand we gave out about 13 Bibles or so. Um, so it was, a, it was a success, and it was made possible through um, uh, the great generosity of um, certain individuals, and, and one in particular. And so uh, we are fortunate to have had that opportunity to reach out to the community. So if anyone in Safeway knows that you're in the church and they say thank you for the ham, that's what that's about. We, uh, so there, and we kind of did that on the fly. We had a meeting on last Sunday, and uh, a couple of the men, a few of the men put that together really fast. So thank you to, I believe, you know, Paul and Dan and Jeff and, and I believe a couple others uh, were also involved as well. So thank you to those men who uh, were involved in uh, putting that together and giving those hands away, reaching out to the people in this community. A few other announcements. Um, one big one, Chloe's friend Stephanie. We have heard about her um, quite a bit lately. Um, and the last thing we'd heard is that she quit dialysis. So she probably doesn't have very much longer to live. But she was baptized this past week, so um, that is a great amen. Um, and I know, uh, talking with uh, Dina, she, you know, Chloe, and, and some, she's been coming to some of the women's studies as well. And a lot of work, a lot of time has been spent with her. And so, to see uh, to see God work in her, and uh, for that to come to fruition, that's a wonderful thing. And that's the thing that we really hope for for every soul who isn't saved yet. So. That is very encouraging. We uh, also want to keep in mind Dan's uh, brother-in-law. Uh, his name is Larry. He was just diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. Um, Little Carol, which is Hubie and Carol's daughter, Carol, and she's known as Little Carol. That's how I've always heard of her. But anyway, Little Carol. <laughs> um, apparently, she broke her arm on Christmas Eve, so... Um, not the most enjoyable way to spend Christmas, but um, let's let's keep her in our prayers that she'll recover well. Uh, we also want to uh, keep Gary in mind as he's going uh, to southern Idaho on an elk hunt to help his son out um, with, with this elk hunt. So he'll be gone most of the week, probably through to New Year's at least. We also want to uh, keep uh, Tim and Shalise in our prayers as well as they'll be traveling back tomorrow. And it was good to see you guys again. I know we get to see you off and on once in a while, but thank you for it was it was fun to see you. And I'm glad I'm, it's probably even better for Cindy. So it was good that she got to see them as well. And one last announcement that I have is that right after services, the men are going to have a quick meeting probably before potluck, I understand. So so uh, for those men that are um, here and uh, involved, please, uh, please meet in uh, Paul's office right after services. And with that, um, please turn your song books to song number 480. Um, Paul will be leading us in songs in just a moment. Oh, go ahead, Jill. What if you... Yes, Linda. Awesome. Yes, yeah, Linda. She she's been she's she's been around for a few years now, and I remember seeing her a lot. And I think work pulled her away a lot too, didn't it? So let's let's pray for the Lord to work through Jill to to reach uh, Linda and study with her more. And uh, and it's an encouragement to all of us when we all take that time and opportunity to study with folks. It's uh, it's it's a it's a huge commitment, but it's it's uh, it's exactly what God wants of us, and so thank you to everybody who does that. And uh, 
with that in mind, let's, uh, let's go to our Father in prayer. Please pray with me. Our blessed Father in heaven, what a wonderful day this is. What a great opportunity we have to be gathered here in your name to worship you. We ask that as we go throughout this hour, that you will be with those who lead this service, that you will be with Paul as he brings us a lesson, and that the words he says, that you will help us to receive them in our hearts, that we will grow in our faith with you each and every day to to do better for you and to give you all the praise and glory that you truly are. Help us in everything and be with all of those who are, who are hurting in some way or another. And help us individually to continue to reach out to those around us to be that light that your son is. To be that light that others can see that and to know you and your love and understand your will for us in this life. We're so thankful for you and for your son in whose name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want to have you open to a verse that most of you have memorized. Turn to John 3.16. We're going to be looking at John 3.16 and 17. And then also over to Romans um, chapter 5, verse 8. You know, a lot of times we have a problem. We have a problem in doing the same thing over and over and over, and it becomes mundane. Shame on us if that happens during the Lord's Supper. But we do it. Sometimes we just go through the motions, and half the time we don't even remember what we did. We do stuff like that all the time, don't we? Just expecting the same result every time. But if you look at John 3.16... I want us to really look at it. It says, for God, God the Father, the creator of all things, the hope we have in eternal life. He sent his son. In a minute, we're going to look at that. But awesome God, perfect in every way. So it says, for God, so loved the world. He's not talking about the trees and the grass and the flowers and the beautiful, we drove in this morning, the beautiful snow-capped mountains. Wednesday night we looked out and the sun was setting over the tops of peaks of the mountains. It was, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about every one of mankind in the world. That is what he's talking about. So God the Father so loved us that he sent his only son. Now, some of your versions may say begotten son. The word begotten means, you know what that means? That means his true and only son. Not just a mythical thing or just something that just happened that he claimed. It was truly his son. And then we're going to hold your place there and we'll look over to Romans chapter 8. We're going to talk about that son real quick. Starting at verse, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 5, sorry. Starting at verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love in us, for, uh, for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified in his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So God gave his begotten, his only true son, out of his love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How many times have we read this scripture and memorized it and just read over it? Because we know it. We could probably preach half a dozen lessons out of this one verse. And for why? 
It says, for whoever believes. Now, let's talk about believe. It doesn't mean I believe there's a God, so I'm going to heaven. Because it goes on to explain. We need to be in full obedience, which is what we're doing this morning. We are gathered around this table, Acts 27, as we've been instructed to do to remember that sacrifice that he made. The belief here is an action, not just a thought. It says, <clears throat> whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the perish there is an eternal death, a punishment, a constant death. But in him, because of his son, we have eternal life. We have hope in what we're doing the best we can and the promise that he gave us for eternal life. It says in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. When you break down these scriptures like this, you understand the major impact of it. Our loving God sent his true and only Son out of his love for us. He... Because of his obedience to God, Jesus went to that cross. Hung there, was sacrificed, went through all the stuff we all heard that he went through. Out of his what? His love for me? For you? For mankind. And he's asked us to believe in him. He's asked us to be obedient unto him. I don't think that's much to ask. When we know that his way is perfect. My way is not. If you're going to watch me, you're going to mess up. And I'm sure most of us could say that. But our Lord and Savior is perfect, as we talked this morning. We need to believe in him. This morning, we're gathered around this table to remember that sacrifice. To partake of this bread, which represents that body that was beaten and scorned and ridiculed on that cross out of God's love for us. Bow with me. Dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, the blessing that we have in gathering around this table and remembering the love of our Savior. Father, bless this bread and the ones that are partaking it. Help us to do so in a manner pleasing in thy sight. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We love you so much. And it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood on that cross. The loving Heavenly Father, again, we come to you humbly, thanking you for your son, thanking you for your love and the sacrifice that he made out of his love for us. Bless us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's shed blood. Pray, Father, that all we do in a manner of pleasing in your sight. Thank you so much, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We now, at the conclusion of the Lord's Supper, have an opportunity to give back. And it should be out of love, the same love that God had to send his son. We just sang a song. We paid a debt, he paid a debt that we couldn't begin to pay. We also have an obligation to give back to him of what's already his. How simple is that? We're giving back to him what he's already blessed us with. We have an obligation to the community, to the congregation here, to keep it going and to spread the gospel. We gave out hams this week. 
We were blessed to be able to do so. And a lot of people were blessed. We had people so thankful about receiving that. At Christmas, there's kind of two extremes. You have the overindulgence, and then you have some who struggles just to make it work. But even greater than that is the world that struggles with their soul. And we pray that we can take these funds and help those that are struggling with their souls. Because it's real. We have this blessing because our Father loved us so much. And let's keep that in mind. This is, this is a very important part of our worship to Him. So at this time, Jack, would you lead us in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you bestowed upon us on a daily basis. As we prepare to take up a collection to further the work of your church, let us give freely from those blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, be turning in your Bibles with me to Psalm 37. I bet by now that number sounds familiar to us, to you, because I've mentioned it so often this year. Psalm 37. Much as the song that we just sang, there were some people who had, it seemed to them, much to fear and much to dread. And Psalm 37 relieves them of that fear. As you turn there, I might urge you as well to hang on tight to your seat. Because I'm about to say what I've never said in a sermon. Oh, Dina looks scared. <laughs> no, I really haven't said this because most of the time when someone in the world says this, I just despise the notion when Oprah or Joel Osteen says something like this. The something like this is like Napoleon Hill said in his book, Think and Grow Rich. He said, you are the master of your destiny. You can influence and direct and control your own environment. And you can make your life what you want it to be. Powerful men like Henry Ford and Nelson Mandela and even Prince Harry have espoused that notion. It comes from the 18th century poem or 19th century poem called the Invictus. It says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Well, it's an intriguing notion, but it's also a debatable one. Because in the world's view, the world sets man at this very center of his own universe where he's only concerned about his own soul. He makes himself his own Lord. As though all that matters is what, what you want for your own self. You know, that's a dangerous notion. It is a dangerous notion. Because as Christians, we know that we are not our own. Do you remember Paul saying that to sinful Christians in Corinth? In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. The apostle rebuked self-centered self-serving, sinful saints, saying, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God and you are not your own? No doubt somebody argued with him about that. They said, well, why not? Why not? They certainly were practicing their faith as though they were their own, doing their own thing. Why not? Because in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 23, you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. I believe here we do understand that we are not free to do our own thing because our soul is on loan and we are not our own. And yet in another sense, also a biblical sense, we are to some degree we are the master of our own fate. That is true. But we need to understand that it's really not our own fate. It is the fate that God has set for those who love him and for those who don't. 
And in that sense, you are the, the director of your destiny. We gather this even from Psalm chapter 37. By now you know something of this song because, psalm because I've mentioned it all year long. Particularly in that verse, Psalm 37 in verse 4. It says, delight yourself or just delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I think it's worth noting he didn't say God will give you the desires of your own heart, did he? Rather, he's going to give what he knows is good. What he knows is good to all who are delight in conforming our lives to Christ. All who delight in, in treasuring those things that God treasures. All those whose lives are being shaped according to God's own heart. By 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14. All the, this shaping of our lives according to God's own word. And so now at the end of the year, we're at last going to consider the entire song. The whole song in its several stanzas. After having read it slowly and carefully several times, the message becomes clear. There are people who are, like many people in this world today, deeply distressed about all that goes on around us. About all the evil and the wickedness, and we wonder how it might end. And the message becomes clear that for both believers and unbelievers, for the saved and those we pray yet will be saved, this is true. That your desires and your delights are daily determining your destiny. Your desire and your light, delight is determining your soul's destiny. And that's why we'll see in Psalm 37, that there are more than twice as many actions, more than twice as many verbs connected to what man is doing compared to what God will do. Because God has already proven himself, hasn't he? He's proven his love. He's proven his word. He's proven his faithfulness. And so we find that there, again, are more than twice as many actions required of man, what we must do, than what God is doing. So this morning we're going to together read this rather slowly. And I want us to notice that God is responding to the choices that we are making. God is responding to the choices that we are making according to what he has said. Psalm 37 verse 1 and 2. Notice how many instructions are about our actions. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Immediately, it sounds like that feeling we get sometimes that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Somebody's got a lot more than I do. Somebody's living a whole lot easier than I am. It always looks a little greener over there. But how long is that going to last? These first two verses tie us to the previous song about those people who are suffering because of the sins of the wicked and people are distressed by that then and now people are are distressed it 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 just doesn't quite seem right day to day and so these people God's people are binding up their souls with all this fretting like weaving a tight netting around their soul binding up their souls with worry rather than releasing their souls in faith. I think if we're honest about it, we'd have to admit this year in 2020, there's been a fair amount of such worry even in the Lord's church. And so the question is, what is the solution? Well, in the first stanza, we began to see the solution in verses 3 through 6. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Trust in the Lord. Again, notice there's more than twice as many things we are to do because God has already proven what he will do. 
You see, trusting God is the active cure for fretting. Trusting God is the active motivation for doing good. Trusting God in that we, we have the confidence in, them, in Him that we are actually cultivating faithfulness. Some of your translations might say feed on faithfulness. Cultivating faithfulness is the means of our dwelling securely. Because that word, that word for cultivating there is about making your faith your closest and dearest friend. It's really talking about building friendships with faith. It's so that in any, any circumstance that our faith is always right there with you. As I mentioned earlier about Christ sticking closer to you than a brother. That is the, the effect of this. Make faith your closest friend so that it is always there with you to quiet your worry. But we see in that word cultivate that we must feed faith. Feed faith even as you would your dearest friend. I remember many years ago, we, our family went down to see my favorite aunt and uncle down in southeast Texas. We were there just for a few days, but every meal for those three days was this feast. It's my aunt saying, you're my closest and dearest loved ones here. Feeding that friendship, that bond. We must feed faith in that way because we know that our God is faithful. And we know that Christ sticks closer than a brother. Certainly then it is in such a friend, and in verse 4, in such a Lord that our soul delights. So that no matter what is going on around you, no matter what your enemy is saying about you, or saying against you, no matter how the world may mistreat you, you delight yourself in the Lord. It kind of feels like I ought to say that word delight kind of softly. Because such delight is sort of like that sweetness of your favorite candy that you let sit in your mouth for a while. You don't chomp it down. You don't woof down your favorite candy. But you leave it in your mouth to sweetly savor its flavor. That word delight describes not a sharp taste, but literally, literally a delicate kind of sweetness. Cultivate really is a word that means dainty. It's a dainty taste made delicious by savoring it, making its flavor last. If I'm not careful, I'll make myself hungry for some more candy. But, but making this flavor last, that is the intention of this psalm. It is the intention of the psalm to feed the souls of the faithful with the lingering flavor of God's goodness. Certainly we know that. We've tasted it even as the Hebrew writer says. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5. As Christians we have tasted the good word of God. And as Christians we are trusting his power for the age to come. That is our delight. And yet in addition to those actions we've read about. There's even more actions required of us in verses 7 through 11. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. And yet a little while and the yet wicked man will be no more. You will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land, and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. What's the worry here? There's three verses of it here in this psalm. The people see the apparent prosperity of the wicked, and somehow it appears that God is prospering sinners. But no way. He's not prospering sinners. Rather, he says, rest in the Lord. It means, again, to be refreshed. To be refreshed in his word. And in his promises, be refreshed by what he has proven. This is the assurance of the Lord's working and keeping us. 
It is the assurance we get from Psalm 23. That picture of, of our shepherd leading us and feeding us in green pastures. The shepherd watching over us as we drink beside quiet waters. To rest in the Lord is also as we see in Psalm 23. It is for his restoring our soul. It is a reminder as we sang earlier in a song this morning. That there is indeed a place of quiet rest, a place of full release, a place of comfort sweet. And it's always near to the heart of God. And so clearly we, we begin to see that God is responding to the choices that we have made. He has proven himself. He has given us his word. He has given us his promises. He has proven them throughout the ages. And he is responding to the choices that each one of us is making. Including as well, responding to the choices of the wicked. Beginning in verse 12. The wicked plots against the righteous. And gnashes at him with his teeth. Do you ever feel like that sometime in the world? No matter how you're trying to live for the Lord and do what you ought and love people as you ought. And sometimes that's the response you get. Like the logo on the junkyard bistro down there. That dog with the gnashing teeth. Well, that's what's concerning these saints. The Lord laughs at him. For he sees his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needed, needy. To slay those who are upright in conduct, those who presume themselves to be upright in conduct, their sword will enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. The Lord laughs at him. He certainly doesn't find it ha-ha funny. Rather, the Lord finds it so utterly unreasonable that it is with derision he is mocking the foolishness of the wicked. Far better are the actions of the faithful. Far better. Even though it might seem as we perceive things in the world around us that we are the ones that are suffering and everybody else is, is prospering, notice in verse 16, what's better? Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil, and in the days of famine they will have abundance. But the wicked will perish, and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. It's a picture of the harvest that in the scene in the Revelation, after the gathering of the grain, though what's left, the stubble and the stalk in the field is vanishing as it is burned. Verse 21, the wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those blessed by him will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. Again, God is responding to the choices that we make, having revealed himself to us in his word to reveal the, the nature, the life of those who live for God and live to love as we ought versus those who, well, are better known for the gnashing of teeth. For whatever man chooses, we see that if we are merely doing our own thing, if we delight most in doing our own thing, certainly God is not pleased. And therefore we begin to see, no matter what, how it might seem in this world around us, we begin to see the reality in verse 23, that in reality God is establishing the steps of the righteous. It's not only that he has set out the steps that we should go, but when we're walking in those ways, he is establishing us firmly in that way. He is establishing the steps of the righteous because we know, we know that our soul is not our own, but that we belong to God. It is our Lord who establishes the steps that we are taking. We are at long last getting to what I consider to be the heart of this lesson this morning, beginning in verse 23 through 31. 
The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. David speaking, I give experience, a lifetime of experience in the Lord's working. I have been young, and now I am old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from good and do evil. Here comes the actions required of us. Depart from good and do evil. Or, I'm sorry, depart from evil and do good. I'll get that right. It does make a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> We're going to read it one more time just to make sure I get it right. Depart from evil and do good. So you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice. It does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. That's the heart of the lesson there, framed by those two verses, 23 and, and 31. Our steps are established by the Lord, and those who are walking in his ways, our steps will not slip. Regarding what we desire and how that is shaping our des destiny, again, God is responding to our choices. When our choices are according to that which he has set in his heart, and said in his word, our foot will not slip. It doesn't mean that we will not stumble. But there the Lord declares, I will hold your hand. We'll stumble, but we will not fail. It will not be like stumbling and being like a dog left to die in the ditch. He's always going to hold us up. For those who are delighting in the Lord, keeping his commandments, the Lord is keeping you. Because the Lord himself has determined to give you what you desire. Which happens to be the mutual desire, doesn't it? It's what he's wanted us to have from before the beginning. The gift of eternal salvation. To that end, I have come to see this song, psalm even more intriguing. Because it makes us aware of the difference of what we perceive and the reality. These saints at that time, it just seems like everything's upside down and turned inside out, that the wicked are prospering and the saints are always left to be in want. Well, that's just not true. We're made aware by this psalm by, of the difference between our perceptions and our reality. They are imagining that somehow God is prospering sinners and, <clears throat> and that the wicked will prevail. But David makes clear what they perceive is not true. God is in no way regarding unbelief, unbelieving, unrepentant sinners because this is the reality. If you want a good dose of biblical reality, this is it. Psalm 37 verse 15. The wicked are destroyed by their own wickedness, by their own sword. Real, in reality, verse 17, the arms, meaning the strength of the wicked, will be broken. This is real, verse 20. The wicked will perish. This is real, verse 38. Transgressors will altogether be destroyed. The memory of the wicked cut off. It is the destiny that those people have determined for themselves. Sometimes in years like this, whatever your worries, whatever your trials, here is a dose of biblical reality that God is establishing the steps of the righteous. He is establishing the righteous in the assurance of his salvation according to his own heart, according to his own word. A dose of reality is verse 24. The Lord is delighting in the ways of the righteous. Remember the meaning of the word delighted? 
What's the Lord doing? Delight describes that delicate sweetness, that dainty taste that even God is pictured as wanting to savor in his mouth as long as possible to savor that flavor, make it last. For the truth is, we who have tasted the goodness of God, God is delighting in his having fed us his word. Remember that meaning for cultivate faithful, faithfulness? It's about feeding, making one your closest friend. God's delight is having fed us his word and having brought us to this assurance. In reality, God is savoring the taste of his own goodness. That's what this psalm gives to us as well. So what follows then is a comparison of the ways of the wicked and the ways of the righteous. The contrast of those who keep the Lord's commands to those who, well, persist in doing their own thing. And either way, the goodness of God is, is proven. Let's begin reading again in verse 32. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked, violent man spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in his native soil. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man. Behold the upright. For the man of peace will have a posterity. The transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. All I can say is what a song. What a song. What a blessed assurance. In those several stanzas, David is, is wrestling on behalf of the, the, God's people there. He's wrestling with the, the riddle of the seemingly prosperous life of the wicked. And what seems to be the want of the righteous. And that's why it's a song for the ages, isn't it? We still wrestle with that today. Why the wicked prosper, and even at the cost of the righteous man's suffering? But you see, the answer to the riddle is not found in our present circumstance, is it? Even as it appears maybe to be dark and, and hopeless in some days, it, our, the answer is not in our present condition. The answer is in the assurance of our future condition. That is real our future condition in all that God has promised. You see, we have this blessed assurance that indeed all things are established by God. And because God knows all who are his own and equally knows all who are not, then in reality, God is calming our hearts, settling our minds, unbinding us from the fret, the fretting, even in the midst of this world's present distress. That's pretty much what people are talking about this year, isn't it? Isn't that the bulk of what people are talking about? The world's distress, the darkness, the disease, the, disease, the, the deception. When arguably we could say that the disease is the deception. Pandemic are the lies held up as being reality when they're not. You look at things my way or I look at things somebody else's way and this is said to be real and that's said to be real when none of it is. What's real is God. That's what's real. In reality, God is calming our hearts and our anxious mind. The first stanza urges us to trust in the Lord. The second reminds us of our refreshing in Christ. And that is the real refreshing the real refreshing that we have in Christ. The righteous are refreshed in spirit, knowing that it is by our delighting in what the Lord 
desires which determines our destiny. I think that's why there are more than twice as many verbs connected to our actions than what God is doing. It is us who have to be proven. God delights in our obedience to walk in His ways. It can be said by all these commands that, well, God has ordered our lives. He, by His commands, sets our lives in order. And as we sang also earlier, there's a line in one of those songs that says, And let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. That is what the world needs to see in us, isn't it? That beauty of God's peace. Certainly David's son Solomon came to understand the value of a God-ordered life. He said in Proverbs 20 and verse 24, Man's steps are ordained by God. How then can a man understand his ways? It's a great question. It's a great question. Because all things are ordained by God, then essentially the question is, apart from the knowledge of God, how can you understand anything? The simple answer is you don't. You really don't. Apart from the Lord, wicked man is without understanding. As Jeremiah says, in Jeremiah chapter 10, Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, he says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Still, the problem is evident in this psalm. That each one who determines to walk in his own way will in the last day find that there is no one to save him. That's the assurance in the song, isn't it? That those who walk in the ways that are ordered by the Lord, they are assured of eternal salvation. But Isaiah 47 and verse 15 says, those who do their own things will find in the last day no one to save you. It is what we see, if you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah ch chapter 28, he makes this same case. That God is responding to the choices that we make. We know his will. What would he would have us to do, how he would have us to live. But in Isaiah chapter 28, beginning in verse 9. Talk about knowledge. We can certainly know what God would have us to do. But these who reject knowledge, verse 9, to whom would he teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just taken from the breast? For he says, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. What's he talking about? God's revelation over time. God's revealing His will according to His own heart. Indeed, He will speak to the people through, under, through stammering lips in a foreign tongue. He who said to them, Here is rest, give rest to the weary. And here is repose. But they would not listen. And so the word of the Lord to them will be order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there that they may go and stumble backward, be broken, ensnared, and taken captive. In the midst of a distressful world, when, as we see in Psalm 37, those people are greatly fearful that somehow God is prospering the wicked, if we connect Isaiah's warning to Psalm 37, we see that those who are delighting themselves in disobedience have determined their own destiny, order by order, line by line. It's not merely that God establishes the steps of the righteous, but of the righteous, He is keeping us in the way that we are to walk. The Lord de delights to, to preserve the righteous in every step we take. It's all conditioned on what we desire and what we delight. Do you delight in being the master of your own fate or do you delight in God's mastery over you? 
That's a decision we still need to wrestle with. Who is the master? Many times this year I've asked, what do you want? All the while knowing that the far better question is, what does the Lord require of you? This psalm tells us, doesn't it? In all those many actions, in all those many verbs, that's what the Lord requires of us. In our obedience to the Lord's commands, we are trusting Him. We are resting in the Lord's reflection, refreshing. We are assured, knowing that He will give to us what He has long desired for us to receive, our eternal salvation. To that end that is promised, I want to end this year by commending the steps that many of you are taking. And trusting that God is establishing you in this church in those steps that you are taking. There is developing a, an intense desire to make stronger connections to this community in local and personal outreach. Stronger connections in personal service. We began last week. So much more yet needs to be done. But as we continue that, I trust the Lord is establishing in those, us in those steps that we need to take. There is in 2020 a great evidence of a stronger longing to keep the saved saved. To keep them, to hold on tight. To encourage the weak and those who, whose steps indeed have slipped. You know, it seems... That as soon as one is strengthened, there's a need to strengthen yet another. It's always going to be that way. In this world, there's always this need to strengthen one another. But in our love to keep one another and delighting in their keeping, the Lord delights in, in blessing this church. We have indeed been blessed. And I mean that in this way, one obvious way. You know, the perception in small churches is that we really can't do much. We can't do much because we don't have the financial means. But the reality is God has prospered us abundantly with the means to do more. And as we determine to do so, I trust He will establish us in those steps. I'm convinced that the steps that we are taking and the decisions that we are going to make in then the coming year are going to establish this congregation's future. I see us coming to a, a, a crucial time when we very much need to, to do, just as Jill mentioned, speak, spend an hour with that person who is weak and, and struggling. Spend an hour. You know, sometimes you... Maybe it's a note. Sometimes it's just going to get in a brother's face. and <laughs> You just have to. To hang on tight. Keep them. Love them. Cherish them. Keep them. I'm convinced that the Lord is blessing us as He establishes us in every step we take. And so let us trust Him. Let us trust that He will strengthen us to do more than we have thought. And do still more in the future. It's a powerful message, very simply said, delight yourself in the Lord. Sometimes you do just have to stop, like putting a sweet piece of candy in your mouth and just savoring it a little bit. Make the flavor last, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That mutual desire, what He's always wanted to give us, eternal salvation. And what a day that will be. What a day that will be. That's what Psalm 37 is pointing those saints towards to cause them to be reminded what a day that will be. That is our closing song this morning. What a day that will be. When with Jesus I shall see, when I look upon His face, there to see His amazing grace, when He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. We won't remember anything of this place. What a day that will be. As you may have need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, whether it is from release 
for release from your worry, to be unbound from your fretting, to be forgiven of sin, to be strengthened in the faith, to trust him all the more, to know his refreshing. We pray that you'll do so. Looking forward to this glorious day. Let's stand together and sing 916.